completely free, and they do this because they want to sell you on this social media automating uh, marketing software called Agora Pulse. You don't have to sign up for that at all. The blog and podcast are free. And what they do is they use the scientific method to test their results of different particular trends. Like, okay, do single image ads work better than carousel ads? And they'll run it amongst their entire database of all their clients and tell you like what actually works or doesn't work. How many hashtags should you include on Instagram? How many hashtags should you use on LinkedIn? How long should your post be? Like these are all like really, really important things that people will talk about, but aren't really backed up with actual data. And this, they actually tested across hundreds and thousands of users. So one of my favorite resources to understanding like what particular changes are being made in the world of social, tested with the scientific method. And much like they, they use this kind of method, uh, the scientific method, I would also encourage you, like when it comes to social, you have to be continually testing these things to see if it works out for yourself. Because just because it works for someone else doesn't necessarily mean that the same tactic is gonna work for you. I, I oftentimes like to say that your uniqueness is your greatest strength, not how well you emulate other people. And you're only gonna know this if you test it against your own specific goals. So chances are that most of you here have very different goals for yourself. It might be this larger overarching goal, like yes, we want to be successful musicians, but if the goals are truly smarter, they're gonna look vastly different because you have different audiences, you have different priorities, you have different things to offer the world. So let's talk about some of the other kind of like practical stuff of what you can do in terms of social media and, and smarter goals. Oftentimes I like to tell people, when it comes to so social media, you need to think like this, more like a telephone and less like a megaphone. Don't treat social media as your platform where you're just constantly shouting, bombarding, promoting people. Treat it as a platform where you can engage and have a conversation and a relationship with fans. Because that's the only way you'll be sustainable. I mean, nobody wants to be shouted at all day. Nobody wants to receive your newsletter every single day if it has nothing of value for them. If they can't see themselves in your work, then they're just gonna tune you out. And because Facebook, and I would say Instagram as well, is constantly refining their algorithm to make it harder and harder for people with business-owned pages or artist pages to reach their own audiences, you have to do this, you have to engage. It's more important than ever, otherwise you're just gonna get lost in the mix. In other words, let's make social actually social. Like think about it in terms of how you can build a community. How can you get your fans to engage with each other and not just with you? Because that's what actually helps you launch like your content. It helps you go viral, so to speak, if, if your fans are sharing with each other. Nothing in the world has ever gone viral from one person pushing it. It only goes viral when people organically engage with it and share with each other. So there's no tip, there's no trick, there's no tagline or a combination of hashtags and keywords that you can do on your own to make something go viral. There's no amount of money that can make that happen. It can only happen if you produce something that people are so excited about, that's so relevant to them and their specific personal identities that they can't wait to share it with people just like them. Build community. And I would also, can't emphasize this enough, but don't give up ownership. Don't give up like all your content to social media companies. At the end of the day, owned content rules. So that means things like owning and working your own email list. Like where you actually have the contact information. Or, you know, hopefully you still have like a plan to use actual snail mail, like physical mail, or phone numbers a website, like these things are still really, really important. And we'll get into the nuances of that in, in just a little bit. But I, I, I can't emphasize this as enough. Like when it comes to social media, don't give up ownership. If you're only relying on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever channel it is to reach your audience, then you're giving up ownership over your own audience to somebody else. Because, you know, how many people have posted something that does pretty well on Facebook and you get this message immediately asking you for money? Sorry. Like if it's so great, Facebook, if it's so important, why are you making me pay for this? People want to see it. Facebook's like, nah, nah, drop a hundred bucks here if you want to see, if you want your audience to see your own message. Like the fans that you developed, you cultivated, you got these followers, all of a sudden you got to throw Facebook 
coins every single time, that's not a sustainable practice. Like, you can certainly invest in Facebook advertising and in, in, in all these other social platforms. Like, that, I, I do agree, it can be an effective method of, of doing a couple of different things, but it's not sustainable to be giving social media companies money all the time. So, you have to remember, like, how can I drive people to my own properties? Because if you have an email list, it doesn't cost you money to send it to them. You don't have to boost, like, your email newsletter if you want people to read it, all you have to do is make emails that people actually want to open and read and share. Like, there's no particular like monetiz monetizing trick when it comes to that. People either will engage or they won't, but you don't have to be, you don't have to like, trick yourself into the system by boosting every single post. So, let's talk about these own particular properties because I think the same mindset uh, falls into the world of social media. Uh, so number one, you can actually use social media channels like YouTube to help you build search engine optimization for your own properties, like your website. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do. A lot of times people ask about search engine optimization and they think it's just about meta tags and keywords. And while that's true and it's helpful, there's a much more useful trick to do this because the number two search engine in the world is YouTube. So if you produce a video and you upload it and it's got all that keyword content that people are searching for in the video, you're gonna rank higher. But you gotta take it a step further. So when you upload a YouTube video, you gotta caption that video. Not only does it make you a decent human being because you want your content to be uh, accessible to everybody, but when you actually upload a caption file and you put the words in there that people search for, it's gonna make your video rank higher. If you embed said video into your own website, it's gonna make your page rank higher because of this. Because Google owns YouTube, what do they prioritize? The stuff that they own, right? So I tested this out, uh, tested this out a couple of years ago. Uh, I used to do marketing for higher education. In fact, I developed uh, the first college accredited degree in digital marketing and social media in North America. And as part of like promoting this program, they're like, Simon, you got $10,000 to promote this new kind of degree in marketing at our little community college. I'm like, $10,000? You know, University of Phoenix and Keller and all these people, they're dropping 45 to $50 million a year in keyword ads. How am I gonna compete with that? Well, I did this trick. I said, I'm gonna interview staff and students about the content, because you know, People don't treat Google like flat tire changing instructions. They ask Google like it's their BFF. How do I change a tire? Like, what kind of programs? So I just took those exact same questions, put it in the video, and had people answer it. Embedded it in there, and guess what? While University of Phoenix was dropping $45 million a year in their particular program, I was outranking them every single time, and I didn't spend a dime on this. I did it for free, just by using Google's own platform. If you create content that people are searching for, and you use the tools in a way that serves you and your own content, like I didn't direct them to our Facebook page, like learn more about this program, follow us on Instagram, tweet this, do that, and I said go to our website, put your email in, and that's how we sold out the program. So, be a resource when it comes to your own content. Like, always answer this question, how can I give value to the people looking for content? And just like yesterday, I would say that your music, the stuff that you create for people, yes, it is absolutely a valuable thing. I, I believe that music is fundamentally important for changing the world, but how else can you serve those other needs? And, and I would say, add this little addendum to that question. How can I add value in a way that no one else can? What do you have to offer? Is it a story? Is it a connection? Is it an ability to express a value or experience that no one else can? If you figure out a way to articulate this, again, that uniqueness part of who you are, and you do it through social or your website, people will come looking for that because they will see themselves in your music. And, and you know, that's the same thing with your social. People want to be able to see themselves in your content. Frame it up that way, be, be that resource. Another way to be a resource is to take advantage of something called Hero or help a reporter. 
So for those of you who can't see the screen, helpareporter.com. This is a free resource that you can sign up on. It's daily email digest. So three times a day, you're gonna get emails from helpareporter.com. And what it is is a collection of tens of thousands of journalists every single day looking for subject matter experts, people to interview and profile on their respective things. If you, if you find something that is relevant to you, your personal experience as a musician or otherwise, and you can answer their questions, they'll have you featured on, on the respective media inquiries. So, it's free to sign up, by the way. This is why I think everybody in this room should be signed up for this resource, because it doesn't cost you a thing, except for your time. You open the email, find something relevant, respond. And if you respond, just treat it like any other pitch. Keep it short, brief, straight to the point, and just throw your name in the hat and see what happens. While I was in my undergrad uh, program, I used Help Reporter out, and before, by the time I graduated, I was already interviewed by 2,000 media sources. So I was on US News and World Report, uh, Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and I would answer like literally anything and everything that I could find. Like they were like, we need to interview someone with student loan debt. I was like, I'm a musician with student loan debt. Like, <laughs> we, we want to talk to somebody who has been to like all these hipster cities like Portland, San Francisco, and, and Brooklyn. And I'm like, I live in Portland, Oregon, hipster capital of the world. Like, you know, I, and, and I would just kind of sneak it in there. Like instead of just answering the questions about like, why is it a hipster town? I'd be like, well, let me tell you, when I was playing my show outside, <laughs> A dude rolled by carrying a boom box while dressed like a taco on roller skates. <laughs> like that was something else. And guess what? They linked to my music. And it became the top story for Travel and Leisure magazine and Yahoo Travel and like 10 other sources because they loved that story so much. It was the front cover of Travel and Leisure magazine for a story about a guy dressed like a taco. <laughs> like that's how you can like, as long as you find a way to add value and speak to their story, They'll, they'll feature you, they'll, they'll put that byline in, and at the very least, at least you have another story to share with people, more content. So be that, be that resource. And of course, like, figure out a way to get smart. So the world is changing today. Like, people are engaging with their devices differently. Remember how I mentioned the fact that people don't talk to Google like it's a, some kind of form? They treat it like it's, it's they're the friend. They ask to get questions. Well, more often than not, people are doing that with their, their smart devices, right? Who here has an iPhone? Okay, how many of you talk to Siri like she knows you? She probably knows more about you than anybody else, by the way. <laughs> but like, you can ask uh, that your, your system questions. For example, like I was messing with this yesterday, I was like, okay, Google, who is Simon Tan? Hmm. According to Wikipedia, Simon Tam is an Asian American author, musician, activist, and motivational speaker. Well, there you go. Like, and of course I play in a band called The Slants. The Slants does the same thing if you're ask, asking who The Slants. But because we're an Asian American band, let's search for something uh, like more generic. Like, okay Google, who are some Asian American bands? Here are the top search results. Okay, didn't work for that. <laughs> but number one listed was my band, The Slants. Ooh, wow. So, how do you do this? Well, you go to and actually work with the sources that smart speakers and virtual assistants go for. Things like Wikipedia, creating a page, and helping edit content that, you know, like those media features, they pay off because that was a Vogue magazine feature that had my band in it. Like, you find sources, so media inquiries, which is why helpreporter.com is so useful, but also like, yes, editing Quora, LinkedIn questions, and, uh, and Wikipedia. Like, that's where all these different virtual assistants are crawling to get their information from. So if you can get there, and if you can think about the kinds of questions that you want yourself to be linked to, figure out a way to get into that particular system. So obviously for me, like, distinguishing myself uh, it, which took a minute because apparently Joss Whedon decided to create a character with the exact same name my parents gave me uh, for a show called Firefly. That made it really tough for a long time because it was constantly linking to like Firefly, Firefly, Firefly. And I was like, I'm just gonna keep 
working and developing that brand, it's that reputation, and all of a sudden now, like, I'm outranking Joss Whedon. Like, <laughs> that, that, that's basically how you do it. But you gotta do value and you focus on the, the resources that those things are searching. Another way to think about uh, social and giving value is to rethink like your particular partnerships. In other words, learn how to collaborate in new and innovative kind of ways. A number of years ago, I wrote a book called How to Get Sponsorships and Endorsements. And I kind of made this pitch of saying, don't think of sponsorship as a one-way transaction. It's not just about getting free gear or money in exchange for like a logo on your tour bus or, or your website. That's, that's not a partnership, that's not a collaboration. Like think of things in a much more uh, genuine fashion. How can you give value to your partners? And so when you start thinking of like, okay, how can we tackle these smart systems? How can we tackle social media in this collaborative kind of way? You could think outside of the box. Maybe it's creating a distinct identity for your local area and working with the musicians in that area. That could be one way to do it. A buddy of mine uh, named Eric Stewart, he's also based in Nashville, Tennessee, he created something called Radio Sobro. And it was basically his response to Nashville having this reputation that we're all about country music. He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna create a radio program of people who don't play country music who are local to Nashville. And so he, they created an app, they have a platform, and once a month they have a showcase at a local brewery who sponsors this entire thing to happen. And guess what? Those artists are getting a lot of traction, both as songwriters, so they write for people like Sony and uh, Columbia and all the other record labels that are down in that neighborhood, but also for fans who want something inherently local to Nashville that don't care about country music, now they have a place to go. So when you look for non-country artists, all the Radio Sobro folks pop up. There's another one in, in, in Nashville called Tons, the other Nashville society, same kind of thing. Like, have you ever thought about using your own platform to feature other artists in your area that you care about? Maybe it's an interview with an artist that you play with all the time. Like, hey, I'm gonna use my fan base to get them really excited about you because I love your work. And they can do the same thing in return for you. It's more than just like, let's play on each other's shows. And maybe some of my audience will see you when you perform and maybe some of your audience will see me when I perform. Like, how can you take that to a much bigger place, like online? How, have you ever thought about featuring other artists in your videos? In your, in your newsletter? Because let me tell you, when you feature another artist, guess what they do with that content? Sure. They share it, they promote it. Like no matter what it is, because people love being featured. And they're like, oh, cool, I'm in this particular video, check this out. So I did this a couple of different ways. I created a music video where all I did was have guests from other bands in that music video. I'm like check out this video full of Portland, Oregon artists. And guess what? Every single one of those artists shared that video across their platform. Immediate, like immediate traction and, and that kind of organic sharing. We did this other video where we were on tour, actually to Austin, Texas, like eight years ago when we were playing South by Southwest. I was on, on tour with my band and some of our friends' bands were kind of on that same tour route. And so we thought, you know, we, we kind of like to play jokes on each other all the time. We thought like, okay, instead of like pranking each other in this band, let's prank this other band. And so we did it throughout the trip. We just would film these like crazy escapades of us like doing stuff to this other band. And people loved it, especially that band's fans. So we would do things like take, take their trailer because they never locked it up. Even though we kept telling them to buy that lock for the trailer hitch, we would take their trailer, roll it across town, or like hook it up to something else and hide their stuff from them. Um, Toilet paper did, or one time I, I gave my hotel room to stay in, in Houston, Texas. So we, we checked into the room early, removed all the light bulbs, and hit all the toilet paper so that they, when they came in after the show, they could not figure out what to do. Like, that content was gold when it came to social media. People loved it. I don't think they were like, you know into that particular collaboration, but <laughs> for once it spread like crazy, they were, they were into it. So yesterday I shared this kind of tip of like learning the hashtag. And I will say this, that the trends around hashtags do change pretty often. But one thing that I've noticed is that if you can 
figure out a way to trend in like a smaller niche kind of category or a smaller collection of hashtags, particularly hashtags that are shared like less than 50,000 times, then all of a sudden Instagram will prioritize your ranking in terms of a medium ranking thing and then a larger thing. So I call it kind of the 333 model. Choose three hashtags that are widely used. That big broad generic category, of like two to five million uh, people posting a particular hashtag. Don't do something like 50 million because that's pretty much useless at this point. Like if you hashtag dogs on Instagram, and it's not gonna go anywhere. But like something that's like pretty widely used, um, but, but under five million. Then figure out that kind of medium category. So under two million, probably a couple hundred thousand people using that particular tag, and then something around that uh, sub 50K uh, hashtag use. Because what ends up happening is if you, if you do well in that smaller category, all of a sudden you'll be kind of near that featured results uh, area for, for the medium kind of hashtag, and then to the, to the top result. And if you do well in all three of those categories, the chances are of you being featured by Instagram on their homepage are a lot, lot higher. So you wanna like float in people's feeds um, by, by learning how to hashtag well. Same thing with Twitter, and I would even argue LinkedIn, uh, there's some merit to hashtagging there as well. Like, figure out how people can discover you. But like, don't just hashtag because it's just like, this is a trendy particular tag. Make sure it is extremely relevant to your post because people don't want spam. Like, if it just seems like it's self-promoting, self-serving, people aren't gonna really care about that. Another thing you can think about when it comes to your content is like, is it making people feel something? Make them feel something. Like, people shouldn't like your posts. That, that, like, they should love your posts. They should be excited about it. Or if you think about the different reactions available in Facebook, like they could be wowed, they could be angry, they could be sad. Like, those are the kinds of things that you want. Like, you want to make people laugh or cry. Or, or people, you want to make them like be, want to take action on something in the world, because if it's just like um, it's likable content, it's meh, then people will treat your social media as meh. It's like, eh, well, why should I do anything with this content? But if it really makes them laugh, guess what? They're going to share it with other people, especially people who also delight in that content. If it makes them angry because they're like, there's some really in, severe injustices in this world that I need, we need to talk about this as a community they're gonna share it. If they really, really love the content, they're gonna engage with it. Another way to like help people feel something and to make them react appropriately is thinking about things in terms of a story. So, a story, if you'll recall, has three parts, a beginning, middle, and an end. Like that's like story, story is one on one. Story is one on two is realizing that there's a dramatic arc. So if you think about movies, films and theater and novels and that sort of thing, there's always this dramatic rise. Like things get more and more tense, uh, get more emotional, the action's building until there's a kind of climatic event. How can you think about your social media in terms of the storyline, a story arc? How can you make people feel, like build up that particular intensity? How can you create a dramatic rise? Well, one way, like, it's not necessarily realistic to, like, treat every single post you ever make as, like, this huge, like, story arc, but you can think of your social media and your marketing and even your newsletters and website in the same kind of way by thinking of it as a story arc. Okay, for this quarter, this is what I'm going to focus on. Or these six months, this is what I'm going to do. Like, we got our album coming up. That's going to be the climax. How can we build up to that point? How can we get more and more people on board and excited? How can we get them more engaged so that they feel like there's, there's something at stake here? They feel like that there's something that it's building up to and making sure that all of your content serves that particular story arc. Same thing if you do, like, a video blog or something like that. Like, I think video blogs are, are really, really great, especially, like, tour videos. Anyone here doing like video blog content? Awesome. Like this, again, it fuels that YouTube page, especially if you caption that, and if you embed that in your own page, like definitely be doing that to all your video blogs as well. But like, how can you edit your videos in a way that have this dramatic arc? So it's not just a recap, like, oh, we're here on the road, we're on Reno, we just played Salt Lake City last night. <laughs> uh, here's a song, here's some footage of us like playing the song. 
She's just like driving the van. Like, that's not a story over here. <laughs> like, nothing's happening there. But if you could think of a way to like position it in a way where it does capture like uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end, like it's leading towards something, people are gonna engage with their content a lot more. They're gonna pay attention. They're gonna watch these things. So start thinking about it in terms of like, if this video blog were a short film, what would it look like? What, what story does it tell? What goal does it serve? Same thing with your, your content, your tweets. Like, don't just have like a tweet stream. Like, there's usually this reputation that Twitter is just like, here's what I ate for breakfast, here's what I ate for lunch, here's what I'm doing. Like, like, yeah, that's great, but like, what kind of story are you telling? What kind of brand are you building? What do you want to be known for? So, you can even podcast if you want, or don't. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, same thing goes for Instagram or Twitter or anything else. Don't choose channels, don't choose tools and methods because they're popular. Choose them because they have a purpose, and that purpose is that it serves your goals. If you want a podcast, that's great. We can certainly chat about like how you can be more effective at podcasting, but like remember that you aren't just doing things just to do something, because that's just spending your time. It's not investing in it. You have to be very strategic about that. You, we should always be asking those questions. Why am I doing this? Who is this for? And what is it for? So I'll give you some more personal examples of like how to add this kind of stuff. So I mentioned that, uh, that I worked for higher education for a minute, doing social media. Uh, when I was working for, for Portland Community College, they had this alert system that they wanted to get everyone in the community signed up for. It basically let you know if it was snowing, campus is closed, if there was an accident or something was happening, that you would be notified via text alert right away, the flash alert system. Well, I was out of town at this time, I was actually in New York trapped in a different blizzard uh, while this was happening, and PCC put out this message. It was their automated system that said, all campuses and centers are closed Sunday, February 9th, all classes and events are canceled. There's a link to sign up to their flash alert system, and you can see that after a day of being online, 13 people liked it, 49 people saw this post. Now, if you're a higher education institution with over 90,000 students that you serve a year, 49 people seeing this thing, that's pretty sad. That's, that's pathetic. So I decided, what can I do to like get people Cage, what can I do to make them feel something? And this is before Facebook even had the emotional responses. I did this. I took this Photoshop image of an AT-AT walker because I, I love me some Star Wars. And I said, traffic reports from around town are saying it's pretty bad. Stay safe and warm out there. Screen cap is 30 minutes later. As you notice, over 32,000 people saw this post, which is technically five times more people than were actually following the page. Over almost 500 shares, over 200 likes, and 24 comments. Make them feel something. And by the way, if you notice, this is an absolutely useless post. There's nothing <laughs> useful in it. This is say if campus is closed. So what were those comments? Those comments were like, wait, are classes canceled? Or is there a delayed opening? And it forced engagement. It forced that conversation to take place. And like, uh, actually, if you want to know if your class is canceled, Sign up for that flash alert system. And guess what? 10 times the number of people signed up for that system in the first day than had been signed up for all time. I didn't pay for a boost of this. And it was, it was so popular that the Portland mayor was sharing it. People were sharing it, bragging, this is the school they went to. <laughs> Nobody does that at a community college. But they were doing it for this community college. <laughs> so it, it worked. And again, around, right around finals week, instead of just like posting the finals week schedule, I posted this lovely picture of someone taking a nap in our library saying, welcome to finals week. <laughs> again, people shared it uh, and started engaging with it. Like over 300 people liked that post and I didn't pay for a thing. And they're just like, wait,